So welcome everyone to this week's webinar talk sponsored by CDAC, the Chicago DOE Alliance Center here at UIC. This uh, webinar series highlights developments in studies of materials in extreme environments, mainly high pressures and temperatures, and CDAC is supported by the Stewardship Science Academic Alliance program of the National Nuclear Security Administration in DOE. Going forward, I'm pleased to point out the webinar series will be co coordinated with a monthly webinar sponsored by another NNSA funded center, the Center for Matter Under Extreme Conditions at UCSD, which is focused on plasma physics and high energy density physics, whereas CDAC is a material center. So the talk on March 3rd by Thomas Matson will be jointly sponsored by both centers and the other talks that are uh, planned for the, uh, the remainder of the month are, are on the website. So now to introduce our speaker, Brent Foltz from Caltech. Brent is a longtime collaborator, one of the founding partners in CDAC, was a member for many years and for nine years also a part of our companion Energy Frontier Research Center. Uh, and he's trained many scientists and gone off to the DOE labs as well as to academia. Brent is well known broadly in material science, in part because of his excellent textbooks and his work in electron microscopy and uh, neutron scattering. He obtained his uh, bachelor's degree uh, from MIT in physics and a master and PhD from Berkeley in engineering science, working on most power spectroscopy, in fact. And after several years at Lawrence Berkeley lab, he moved to Caltech. That was in 1985 and has risen through the ranks there. And since 2013, he's been the Barbara and Stanley Brown Junior Professor of Material Science and Applied Physics. So thank you, Brent, for making the time. We're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Russ. And let me see if I can share my screen properly. Is this sort of working? That's right. Just Okay, let me go into slideshow mode here and call up a laser pointer. All right, good. So I'm going to talk about uh, entropy mostly, mostly phonons at temperature and pressure. Uh, the idea is I'm trying to figure out where entropy comes from in materials and how we can control it uh, with temperature and pressure. Uh, this is uh, primarily dominated by phonons, and we'll be uh, looking at atom vibrations, which are the main source of entropy in materials at normal conditions. And this leads into work on the personalities of the phonons. They all act differently, actually, in the same material. Uh, this uh, will be um, uh, varied by pressure. For the first example I'll show of ongoing work on INVAR, iron nickel INVAR, we actually have something new on this old material. And then I'm going to uh, move over to more uh, 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 work that we've completed with neutrons in the uh, topic of uh, uh, silicon and sodium bromide and their thermal expansion. If I have time at the end, I'm going to go into some very peculiar types of phonon behaviors that we've just discovered in the last couple of years, which are uh, associated with anharmonicity and uh, their new types of phenomena for phonon interactions and in solids. So I've been uh, a partner with CDAC in the past uh, and uh, had a number of students, uh, typically one a year. Uh, the uh, students um, in the program uh, have, uh, let me see if I can get myself to work here. Oh dear, now Zoom is acting up for me. Just a second. Turn off the laser pointer. There we go. And uh, for the last four years, uh, the students who are supported are here. Uh, Jane Harriman and Max Marialdo are staff members now at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, Camille Bernal has still got a year or so to go on her thesis. Uh, Nick is a postdoc looking for a permanent position, and Fred has decided to join the tech industry. So here's a, a rather frowning looking Boltzmann, and 
his monument in Vienna with the right equation that'll be the basis for this whole presentation. Uh, the entropy comes from this log of W, which is a number, uh, dimensionless number. We have to count things to get entropy. And those are the equivalent states of a system. So the physical questions are, what is it physically that we're going to be counting to get the omega? And how do we do the counting process? And of course, how big is it too? So the um, simple way to count is uh, shown here for a type of entropy called configurational entropy. If we have an equiatomic alloy with red and blue atoms, say, and put them on a square lattice on the right, we have two ways of making this checkerboard. We can either put the blue atom or the red atom up here, but then there's only one way to put the next one. So it's basically omega is two for this Avogadro's number, or basically just one for every site. Log of one is zero. So this is no configurational entropy when we're ordered. We go disordered and we have a random 50% chance of putting a red or blue atom here. Uh, then we have two sites uh, or two uh, uh, types of possibilities per site. Omega is two per atom and logarithm of two is 0.69. So the maximum change that we can get on this disorder to order transition is 0.69 kb per atom. And uh, this is quite well known. It's usually less than that though, because we have some short range order even when we're disordered. So let's put that on a, a a graph here, and I'll lay out more comp contributions from degrees of freedom in a material at about a thousand Kelvin. Here's how big maybe we'll occupy with the configurational entropy. That was 0.69. I'll say it's between 0.5 and 1.5 in what's called high entropy alloys, where you add a large number of different chemical species. Now, at 1,000 Kelvin, you have a lot of excitations of degrees of freedom. And the amount that can be explained by a harmonic model uh, is on the order of eight Boltzmann's constant per atom. So these are vibrations of nuclei primarily. That's where the mass is. We have to correct that for thermal expansion. And that's a quasi-harmonic correction, which is about as big as the uh, configurational entropy is. If we have a magnetic metal, uh, we have the uh, spins, which we can disorder and get additional entropy, and the electrons can get excited above the Fermi level. So these are all textbook type of uh, uh, topics that you can look up in Ashcroft and Merman, if you like. The um, uh, situation gets more complicated at 1000 Kelvin, though, because these excitations start to interact with each other. Uh, the phonons, the cost to put them in depends on how many you already have. And so that's an anharmonic effect with phonon-phonon -phonon interactions. But the same types of interactions are possible between the spins and the electrons too. And these contributions can be fairly big and we need to get them right if we're gonna do phase diagrams or get an accurate equation of state for a material. So how do we count for the harmonic vibrational entropy, that big red part that was on that previous uh, uh, graph? Uh, it depends on the coordinates of the material. And we have uppercase N atoms in our crystal. And in three dimensions, we'll have three N positional coordinates minus the translational degrees of freedom. Um, the idea is that every atom has a range that it's exploring in its vibrations going back and forth here. And the bigger the range, the more equivalent ways of finding the system. For a harmonic oscillator, that's pretty simple. It just goes as one over the frequency. So the uh, lower the frequency, the wider we move and the bigger the entropy. So these are two crystals which might have different forces between them, but the same atoms. So the kinetic energies uh, are still KT for all of the atoms and we don't vary along the momentum position. So we need to get a volume in this, uh, what we call state space or phase space, uh, which depends on all of these uh, exploration ranges of the positional coordinates from the vibrations of the atoms. And these are the difference in vibrational entropy between the, the beta uh, crystal structure and alpha would be the difference between the two logs or the ratio of the uh, volumes that we explore. And these are all looking simple here as I show it like this, but actually there's uh, Avogadro's number of uh, degrees of freedom and normal modes in the system. So that's pretty complicated. We really have to take a product of this total volume for all of these frequencies, which means we need to know basically all of the frequencies. But the log of these products is the sums of logs, and we can write this out 
is an integral uh, for a continuous function, the density of states. And the difference in vibrational entropy between these two crystal structures would be just their differences in normalized phonon densities of states weighted against these log of frequencies and times 3 kb for three dimensions. And this is the correct result for uh, high temperatures. It works pretty well above the divide temperature. At low temperatures in a material, you have to worry about occupancy factors, so the density of states aren't quite weighted the same way, but that's correctable. The key thing is we need to know what these frequencies are. And to get the vibrational entropy at temperature and pressure, we want to know how omega changes with temperature and pressure. And let's just look at that for a minute here, a simple way, uh, with the uh, two variables, volume and temperature. Now, I like volume because that sets the size of the crystal, and that sets the distance between the atoms. So that's one of the things that you typically do in ab initio calculations, is you figure out what the distances are between your atoms, and the electrons find states according to that. But we've also, we've also got temperature, which is how much they're vibrating about their official positions. So we'll use both of those variables in this expansion for the d omega uh, as a function of first order terms. How does the frequency change with volume? Well, the fractional amount of that is the Grüneisen parameter. We're quite familiar with that. It's widely used, uh, especially under pressure. The next term, though, is how the frequency changes with temperature at a fixed volume. So this is pure anharmonicity. Uh, we don't even need to have uh, thermal expansion uh, for effects like this to take place. And I'll call this an anharmonicity parameter defined in a similar way as the Grüneisen parameter. Now, these second order terms, I want to comment about those because I think there's some opportunities here for future research. We know that at high pressure, you don't always have a linear change of frequency with pressure. You often get a quadratic term or correction there. What about temperature? Well, I think this is going to be small. And I say that because when we do um, many body theory and perturbation theory for how phonons affect each other, those terms are linear with temperature. So I'm going to ignore that. It's this term that I think is going to be very interesting with simultaneous pressure and simultaneous temperature to see how the frequencies change. I'll give some hints of that later on. But right now, I'll just leave it here as kind of a formal development before I get on to our first example, which is an old material. I uh, gave a Nobel Prize to Charles Edouard Guillaume in 1920. Uh, he discovered zero thermal expansion alloy INVAR. Uh, I read his Nobel lecture recently. It's, it's actually fairly well written. It's interesting. And one of the things he describes was taking a wire of Invar and measuring the height of the Eiffel Tower as it expanded and contracted during the day. He put one end anchored on the ground and over 100 meters up was the second platform. And he put a little pen on it and clock drum. And here's his data. So he's got the temperature, which he's measured over a day. And here's the length of the tower. It, it, it grew and it shrank. This was a, a rainfall right here. So the temperature fell quickly and the tower had a little longer time constant. But he commented that the Eiffel Tower is a pretty good thermometer, actually, in spite of its size. Anyway, we made our own sample of Invar. It's not as big as his. It was iron 57 enriched, so we could do nuclear resonance scattering. And here's the lattice parameter versus pressure. Uh, it was done at two temperatures, so these should be the same if there's no thermal expansion. Uh, at higher pressures, though, we get a thermal expansion over 94 degrees uh, Kelvin or so that is uh, reasonable. It's typical of other iron nickel alloys that are not exhibiting the INVAR effect. Now, the interesting region, as you see, is below about four gigapascals. And uh, under pressure, uh, we uh, looked at uh, the uh, behavior of the thermal expansion, and as you just saw, and the reason for doing that relates to the free energy, the Gibbs free energy, whose natural variables are pressure and temperature. Let's take some derivatives here. The first derivative is just the entropy, okay, with respect to temperature. We could take the volume derivative, uh, or the pressure derivative first, we get the volume. Then we take the next derivative, uh, with the other variable, in this case with pressure, and we get how the entropy varies with pressure. Now here we take how the volume depends on temperature, which is the thermal expansion. So this gets to the method behind our experiments. 
Invar has zero thermal expansion, so it must have no change in its entropy with pressure. Doesn't mean all of the pieces of the entropy are going to be pressure independent, but somehow the total has to be equal to zero as we vary pressure over four gigapascals, which is in that Invar range. So what are the pieces that sum to zero? Well, we worked at sector three uh, and uh, we got some nuclear resonant inelastic X-ray scattering uh, with uh, a, a technique which goes through the nuclear excitations from iron 57 for the ground to excited states. And these are very, very sharp in energy. Uh, they're uh, negligible on the scale of milli electron volts. They're down to tens, hundreds of nano electron volts, in fact. So the shape of this uh, main resonance is set by the quality of this high resolution monochromator here. Now we can actually get the nuclear resonance to occur even if we're off this uh, perfect resonance energy, if we create a phonon and bring the energy down to be resonant. And this gives us a good measurement of the number of phonons of those energies, or we can annihilate a phonon. This uh, was done at a higher temperature. Uh, so I do recognize the features of the basic phonons of iron. Here's the longitudinal modes, the high and low transverse acoustic modes. And there's some multi-phonon scattering up here, uh, which comes about when we create two phonons and we get outside the range of the phonons. Anyway, we have to correct for things like that at high temperatures, and we do. Now, this technique requires that we intercept the uh, nuclear decays, which happens sometime after the synchrotron flash, meaning we need a large solid angle of an avalanche photodiode to detect all of these. There's not that many of them, unfortunately. And we have to go through the beryllium gasket to pick them up. We can also nearly simultaneously uh, do nuclear forward scattering, where we look at the time signature of the beats between hyperfine levels. These are, uh, as I mentioned, 10 or 100 nano EV, but they have a time structure when they interfere with each other. I'll show you that in a minute. We can look at the magnetism. Here's data we got uh, just uh, this within the last year uh, for our INVAR sample at room temperature and at 30 Kelvin. This is over the interesting range of uh, about zero to four GPA. And you can see what happens. The phonons get stiffer uh, as we apply pressure. So the frequencies go up, uh, the uh, atoms don't move as much and the entropy goes down. So as we apply pressure, the vibrational entropy is less uh, at higher pressures than at low pressure. 30 Kelvin, things didn't change so much. That's it's interesting, but we haven't analyzed the 30 Kelvin data yet. I'll just show you the room temperature results. Now, here's what we have for the nuclear forward scattering. We have these interferences between uh, hyperfine transitions in the material, uh, which are giving a time structure that indicates uh, magnetism when we have a lot of beats. And if this pattern doesn't change too much, then the magnetism isn't changing very much. And that's what's happening at 30 Kelvin. Uh, these uh, various dips and peaks uh, are uh, more or less in the same place. The magnetism is decreasing. We've done more analysis of this. I'm not showing it here, but I just want to show you the raw data. You can see how this dip is increasing much more rapidly at room temperature and becoming pretty small at uh, four gigapascals or so. Uh, the pattern of magnetism changes a lot. We're disordering the magnetic moments. So the magnetic entropy is greater than zero, the change in that with pressure, opposite from that of the phonons. And we're only looking at the iron part. We have to do a little bit more uh, for the nickel magnetism. Uh, we have some ideas on that, but it's not done yet. Uh, we did find, uh, fortunately, some heat capacity for uh, iron nickel alloys and the magnetic transition in that that allows us to calibrate uh, the change in the uh, magnetic entropy as we're seeing uh, it in the hyperfine patterns. And uh, so we have an approximation to how the magnetic entropy is changing with pressure. Now we also found in the literature some uh, electronic densities of states where we look near the Fermi level to get the electronic entropy. Unfortunately, this is the wrong composition. It's an old paper. I think we can do much better ourselves. We just haven't done it yet. But there's a change of electronic entropy that's non-negligible. I'm not sure it's really that big. Uh, it's one of the uncertainties today. We haven't finished this work, as I said. But here's what we got so far. Here's the um, vibrational entropy and how it changes with pressure. It decreases. 
Here's the magnetic entropy. We've done it a couple of different ways. It increases with pressure as we uh, disorder the spins. The total is kind of flat. We still have to take into account the uh, electronic entropy a little better and uh, do a better job of the magnetic entropy. Uh, we also need to take into account the magnetization of nickel too, which I think will cause this uh, curve to decrease since it doesn't change so much uh, with the invar transition and the spin is smaller anyway. So I think we have a basic explanation of invar. The uh, change in the magnetic entropy with pressure is counteracting the change in vibrational entropy with pressure. And therefore the thermal expansion has to be zero for this uh, material. Now, most of our work is with neutrons, and uh, we can't really control pressure so well with the large samples we need for neutron scattering. And changing temperature is easier. So I'm going to talk mostly about temperature experiments now and discuss where we might go with pressure in the future. Uh, the instrument here that I'm going to describe uh, was uh, uh, shown on the previous view graph under construction as ARCS. I was PI to build it from 2000 to 2007. And it works by timing. So there's a little burst of neutrons in about two microseconds up here. And they fly down with kilometer uh, a second uh, velocities and little spinning uh, cylinders with slots let through the neutrons of a fixed velocity. Let's suppose we let through the green ones in this uh, rainbow of neutron velocities. And they hit the sample, and sometime later we detect them at the uh, detectors. This is all done by timing, and this is where the elastic peak might be hitting the detectors. We get a diffraction pattern in that case, and also a calibration uh, for our energy scale. The uh, neutrons here have lost a little bit of energy, and they arrive later. So the timing tells us the energy transfer to the sample. We also get the angles, uh, not just in this plane of the paper, but plus or minus 26 degrees out of that plane too. And we can, from the angle and the energy transfer, get the momentum transfer. So basically what we measure is the uh, momentum transfer and energy transfer, uh, the number of neutrons that undergo that uh, in uh, interacting with the sample. Now, recently we've been using single crystals. And in this case, we take the single crystal we rotate it by about 200 uh, little steps and maybe over 90 degrees in angle uh, to collect 200 different data sets here, which we can put together and reassemble uh, the uh, inelastic scattering as a function of vector Q, which spans over the whole Brion zone of the crystal actually. So we get a lot of detailed information. Uh, Dennis Kim made a little movie of this for his PhD thesis. This is a silicon crystal, and this is a, some of the uh, phonon dispersions for silicon. And I had a, a nice little way of going through them uh, with an animation, which I better not do. But let me uh, show you how they change a little bit with temperature uh, by uh, going down to room temperature and up to 1500 Kelvin. These are energy vertically and horizontally is the direction in the reciprocal lattice starting uh, from the uh, reciprocal lattice points at gamma out along the high symmetry directions. Now you can kind of see that uh, there's a broadening and a decrease in the energies of these uh, uh, optical modes of silicon. Uh, the transverse acoustic modes down here also uh, soften with temperature uh, and we can get a fair amount of detail on the, on the phonon dispersions from data like this. And uh, we've gone ahead and uh, uh, measured the uh, uh, thermal shifts of the different phonons, and they all have different personalities. Uh, and But mostly they soften with temperature. They decrease in frequency. And we've done some work to interpret these uh, with uh, ab initio MD. Uh, this is basically making a movie of the um, atom positions and the trajectories of them individually. Uh, and uh, time steps that are much shorter than the highest frequency phonon. Uh, we get the uh, usual iteration where we recalculate the Hellman Feynman forces at every step. We move the uh, uh, nuclei a little bit, uh, change their positions and their velocities, and repeat. So, this is one way of doing um, uh, uh, a study of the uh, phonon dynamics. 
to interpret it though, we need uh, to interpret these trajectories. And what we've been doing is use an effective potential method. We have uh, a Hamiltonian that we fit to the behavior of the ab initio molecular dynamics. We have a kinetic energy, uh, and then we have a potential energy, which has got the uh, offset in energy, a quadratic term and a cubic term. And with the quadratic and the offset, we can also approximate the quartic by uh, renormalizing the force constants for the quadratic. But an important part we get is this cubic term. Uh, when we substitute in phonon solutions here, uh, we can get uh, the uh, uh, three phonon process uh, self energy, where we have a vertex correction here, uh, which we get out of these fits to the uh, effective potential to the AIMD. And we can get the imaginary and real parts of this term uh, from a result from many body theory that I'm not showing. Uh, and the imaginary part gives us the lifetime broadening and the real part gives us an additional energy shift, for example. So this is how we do some of these interpretations. This is an anharmonic theory. It doesn't depend just on the volume of the crystal. Uh, when we look at uh, a couple of uh, points in those phonon spectra at a high symmetry point, the 111 uh, on L, we see that uh, these uh, frequencies with temperature decrease uh, for the uh, low transverse acoustic modes. Uh, the quasi-harmonic theory predicts they have a negative Grüneisen parameter and increases. And that's true. Under pressure, that'll be true. Uh, harmonic theory would show nothing. Uh, the, uh, uh, both the ab initio calculation, which we call uh, TDEP, and uh, the ARCS data are in agreement. Uh, and also, it's some arbitrary point in the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice. Uh, and we've looked at about a few hundred phonons in the Brion zone, and 85% of them are incorrect with the sign of the change uh, predicted by the quasi harmonic approximation, which depends on volume alone. But the annoying thing is that the quasi harmonic approximation gets the thermal expansion of silicon about right. And assuming this negative Grüneisen parameter for the low uh, transverse modes seems to kind of work. Uh, it, uh, our experimental data, not our experimental data, but there's a bunch of points here and our ab initio calculations maybe are a little better, but it's not a big improvement. So this is very annoying uh, that it was working. Uh, the quasi-harmonic theory, uh, which is much simpler than handling all of the atom vibrations about their center sites, was working with the wrong phonon physics because that's all you've got. You've got the phonons for the entropy and you have the... Uh, 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 elastic uh, expansion, uh, which is working against that. Uh, so we looked at sodium bromide, where the quasi-harmonic theory, the volume effect, was way off compared to the experimental data. But the ab initio uh, uh, and harmonic theory uh, got it roughly right, except the highest temperatures. And this is a factor of four. So uh, the referees were very happy that maybe uh, anharmonic theory is needed here, unlike silicon, where they weren't really convinced, quite frankly. Uh, but the phonons were very interesting in sodium bromide. Uh, basically, we have two effects uh, of the frequency versus volume and temperature. Uh, the quasi-harmonic effect, the volume alters the frequency. In pure anharmonicity, the temperature alters the frequency. Now, when we do the anharmonic calculations, we actually include both. But we found the pure anharmonicity really dominates the thermal expansion. So here's the idea. You have interatomic forces and vibrational frequencies that depend on how far apart the atoms are as the volume expands, but also on how much they're moving about their center sites. And this uh, temperature effect turned out to be dominant here, uh, pure anharmonicity. So let me uh, get back to that question on uh, what's important for the ranges of pressure and temperature. Uh, we went through this uh, before, and we've done a little bit of work uh, with Tim Strobel at Carnegie on uh, Raman spectroscopy, where we selected a few modes for zirconia and his silicon 24. And Jane Harriman did some calculations on gallium nitride, where she could go to much higher pressures and temperatures. And we could Let's see little things that maybe we could see in neutrons here uh, uh, for the zirconia. This is a medium size effect. We could definitely see it. And we could get some big effects uh, if we're at very high temperature changes and high pressure changes in this cross term, uh, which uh, uh, we had multiple parameter fit. And then we got out the linear uh, uh, in pressure temperature 
uh, quadratic here in this cross term. Now, the product of these uh, suggests that we might need about five gigapascals and about 500 Kelvin uh, to see effects well uh, in a typical material by neutrons. And I think we could uh, uh, see changes in the phonon dispersions under those conditions. But we're not quite there yet. But you may ask, why would you expect something interesting here? How does the pressure change the anharmonicity? Or likewise, how does temperature change the Gruneisen parameter or the quasi-harmonicity? Well, here's one explanation. Let's consider a three phonon process where we down convert this optical mode into two transverse uh, acoustic modes. And I've set it up so that the energies of these two ought to add up to this and the momenta ought to add up. Uh, so this is a typical uh, uh, cubic anharmonicity. Uh, and uh, for one of them, and we'd have to, many of them, of course, uh, but what might happen is that under pressure, the different Gruneisen parameters for these different modes uh, could change so that, for example, uh, this mode might move up faster than these do, and then we lose these three phonon processes. So this is the sort of thing that I think we can uh, uh, find in the uh, 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 pressure dependence of the anharmonicity, and we'll be seeing some uh, combination effects as we increase the temperature and the pressure in these uh, contributions to the free energy and in the phonon frequencies. So we've looked at how to do this, and I don't think we can do it with arcs. Maybe we could do it with high spec, uh, but it would only do one point at a time. Vision would give a whole density of states. Don't worry, the beam was off here for this picture. Uh, we've worked with uh, Bianca Habrol a bit and uh, uh, followed her progress and Ronnie Buller. And uh, we haven't quite succeeded in getting densities of states with vision. Uh, uh, Chen Li, who's been doing a lot of work with this, is uh, trying to extract signals out of this, but it's pretty hard to do right now. I think we might have to wait a little bit before we have a bigger sample here and lower background. Let's see. I have three really interesting anharmonic effects that I can explain. Uh, and I'm going to maybe just do one since I've lost so much time, and I apologize uh, for that. Uh, but we I didn't show you the phonons from sodium bromide, but we found something new. We found two new branches in uh, the phonon dispersions of sodium bromide. Uh, if you have uh, uh, n atoms, you'll have you know, 3n degrees of freedom, uh, which you can transform by a linear transformation like Fourier transforms to get normal modes out, but you'll still have 3n of them. Now, you can use the translational freedom uh, for a unit cell uh, for a two-atom basis that gives three acoustic modes and three optical modes. This is all textbook stuff. It's very well known. But we have eight branches now. And where did these new modes come from? Well, let me show what I'm talking about here. This is 10 Kelvin. We have uh, measured and calculated phonon dispersions, which are in reasonable agreement at this low temperature. Uh, at room temperature, even, we see a new feature here, uh, which grows with temperature. And our collaborator, Mike Manley, had been looking for intrinsic localized modes that we don't really see at 300 Kelvin, but we do see them at 400. They do show up in that case. Uh, so these are additional branches uh, which are showing up and they're temperature dependent and uh, they are uh, associated with uh, anharmonicity in the sodium bromide. And we noticed, oh, that the uh, uh, free energy here is the sum of the energy of this broadband and that broadband. They uh, sum up to be about, uh, was this uh, seven and uh, uh, 17 is about 24 or something like that. And the difference between them is about this uh, 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 intrinsic localized mode energy, which is down here, uh, uh, down, it was supposed to be around eight or something like that. Well, I haven't measured things right, but this is also a little hard to know exactly where that is. But the uh, idea here is that this is an intermodulation effect where we have a medium, uh, sodium bromide, which would have a unity gain. So we put in one phone on and it would have a behavior that looks like a, a, uh, comes out directly if the gain of the medium were one. But if the gain of this medium was being modulated by a very strongly excited uh, phonon of another type, then we could get the product uh, in the output of this red wave times this blue wave, sort of as shown here, uh, where we take the product of these two sine waves and we get this uh, long modulation and then we get these high frequencies. 
And what these are, uh, are the, um, uh, we can make these in terms of a, uh, a sum of uh, uh, the uh, two frequencies uh, and uh, the differences would give these high frequency oscillations and this long wavelength. Uh, the long one is the inter uh, intrinsic localized mode and our ghost mode is this uh, high frequency behavior here. Uh, sorry, there's animation there. Turns out that um, the laser physics community has been doing a lot of work with this, with laser cavity experiments, where they get sidebands around their laser frequency when they detune slightly from the cavity resonance. They've done an elaborate analysis for photons, which applies very well to phonons. Basically, you make a, a system Hamiltonian, which has to do with, say, the TO modes and the number of them and their frequencies, and the uh, 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 TA modes and the number of them. And this one uh, modulates. Uh, the other one is a product term in the Hamiltonian with a coupling parameter eta. This is a free parameter in the model. And they also include a uh, interaction with a noise in the thermal bath down here. Uh, and the coupling to the bath and the coupling between the modes are things that need to be tuned to make this model explain the laser cavity behavior. Well, we can do that too. We don't have a laser here. We have TA modes, and these are in thermal equilibrium. And so we have to take into account their noise, which is not done typically for the laser. But we can uh, work the, with the Heisenberg-Langevin equations the way they do and look at the time dependence of these uh, uh, operators for the uh, uh, transverse uh, uh, optical and acoustic modes, which would uh, non-interacting just be their frequencies. Uh, but we have an interaction with the other mode. We have an interaction with the bath, uh, the noise bath, and we have a damping behavior here. And Yang Shen did work to calculate what these look like. And in the medium coupling limit, we get a behavior that looks like this, where we get uh, a sideband up here, uh, which has got a gap. And the intrinsic localized mode, which is down here, is a lot harder to see. It's on a shoulder, effectively. So we, we think this works reasonably well. We did see these um, uh, ghost modes in the uh, anharmonic calculations with the temperature dependent effective potential method, but they were way too weak in intensity. This one gets the intensities about right, it turns out, when we're in the medium coupling limit. Okay, um, these are uh, this is a new anharmonic effect uh, in uh, intermodulation phonon sidebands, we call it. And it has similarities to the laser cavity experiments, but these are uh, uh, natural processes that are occurring in thermodynamic equilibrium, and uh, there's fewer phonons involved. And in principle, like the laser cavity experiments, uh, when we uh, uh, have one of these uh, ghost modes, it's actually an entangled state for the transverse optical and transverse acoustic modes. I don't know if we can use that for anything because they don't live very long, but nevertheless, it's interesting to see the comparison with all the work that's being done on quantum information. All right, I have two examples which I'll do very quickly. Um, so Claire Saunders has been working on Cuprite. The phonon dispersions are here, uh, energy versus wave vector again. For the structure, we have oxygen atom, which kind of moves in a little cage of surrounding coppers. Uh, the partial densities of state show that the low energy modes are uh, copper and they're one sixth of the frequency of the oxygen modes. As we go up in temperature, this, there's a fuzz in the background at room temperature that totally dominates even at 700 Kelvin. We've lost the dispersions. So we have an approach to this, which is basically looking at how two independent oscillators, the copper oscillator and the oxygen oscillator, move independently, except the oxygen gets bumped in its phase of oscillation between momentum and position when it interacts with the copper. It, that'll only happen when the, uh, sorry, the oxygen gets bumped in its phase when it interacts with the copper and the copper needs to be in a, a certain position, let's say maybe close to the oxygen or at some period, part of its vibrational period to knock the oxygen out of its uh, uh, pattern here, it returns to that because it returns to KT, but the phase error is cumulative and it increases with uh, every time we interact on the time scale with a copper vibration. So these interacting oscillators I could talk about, but basically we set it up as a Gaussian probability for a momentum transfer and it happens uh, every copper period. And this is a problem which is also used in diffraction 
where you make a one dimensional model of an amorphous solid. Uh, and but instead of position, we have time here. So the time correlation function is what we can uh, take these uh, Gaussian uh, probabilities of interaction, uh, Fourier transform it, get the power spectrum. It looks like this. So this is the copper frequency. It has a, a peak here, uh, which uh, would uh, have a set of wiggles uh, at, at higher frequencies, although they should roll off because the momentum transfer isn't instantaneous, just like the atom isn't a point size either for the diffraction experiment. And we have a shape which uh, has a, a part that goes to zero, which seems to be right, a peak here, which is very temperature dependent. <clears throat> I changed this uh, uh, phase shift by 50%, and it completely wipes out uh, that peak. And I think that's what we're seeing in the cube, right? <clears throat> Um, we need to do a little more on that probably to really settle it, but so far it looks like it's a, a change uh, in the phase of the oxygen, which is causing the scattering at the low energies, giving us that background around the copper frequency. So it's really the oxygen doing the scattering. Anyway, uh, we saw some crazy things in sodium bromide here, a uh, very strange breakup of the optical modes that I think are real because the acoustic modes look pretty good. Um, I have really no idea where this comes from. I speculate it might be a transition into classical behavior where we can get more interesting behavior in an oscillator. Uh, so Ron Lifshitz, who was at Caltech, that compared classical nonlinear oscillators to quantum nonlinear oscillators, where you get an uncertainty principle that tends to smear uh, all of these classical features. But we might be getting them back as we go up to higher temperatures. Okay. So let me summarize. I'm sorry for all of the technical problems, but let me try to be efficient in saying what I wanted to say. Um, I hope I've convinced you that the entropy of solids is dominated by phonons. And we look at that in terms of the frequency, depending on volume and temperature uh, outside of the zero Kelvin result. And we can probe these vibrational frequencies with inelastic scattering at both pressure and temperature. Uh, this is uh, something we've done with INVAR, where we've looked at the total phonon entropy, not the individual phonons, uh, from the densities of states. And we can understand it's a zero thermal expansion coming from a cancellation of the magnetic and phonon entropies in the material, a special case there, INVAR. Now, I think in a more general case, we can look at how these frequencies depend on a product of pressure and temperature. If we can get a range of 500 Kelvin and about a range of 5 GPA simultaneously, I think we can do some really interesting studies of uh, new features in how anharmonicity uh, changes with volume or how Grunison parameters change with temperature. Uh, to measure these thermodynamic properties, we want to measure all the phonons. Now, a density of states does that, but it doesn't show you the personalities, the polarizations of the phonons. So I'm pretty excited about these single crystal experiments. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we're probably only going to be able to do those as a function of temperature. We'll need to uh, uh, get densities of states, and we want to do temperature and pressure, I think. <clears throat> um, in our work with the silicon and sodium bromide crystals, uh, neutron scattering at various temperatures, we see that the volume effect on the phonon frequencies is minor compared to the pure anharmonicity, and that dominates the thermal expansion. Uh, so I, at the end, had three uh, novel phenomena that can only be seen really today that we have uh, high performance inelastic neutron scattering, which is factors of hundreds better than what we used to have in the past as far as efficiency for data collection. A lot of things that were swept up as noise are actually interesting. We see these intermodulation phonon sidebands. Uh, this phase noise in cuprite uh, is uh, distinctly uh, separable from the multi-phonon scattering in the background, for example. And we have some very peculiar features in the optical modes of sodium bromide, which we want to uh, look at some other temperatures and see if it's really true. All right, my apologies for the technical problems. Um, Maybe I'll just stop sharing here and I'll be happy to take any questions if there's time for them. I don't know. Yes. Well, thanks, Brent. We still have over 50 people logged in. So really nice data. Thanks for persevering. Elegant analysis. I really like it. So any comments, questions? Just unmute yourself. Um, Alfredo? 
Okay. Did you, go ahead. Did you measure phonon spectra at low temperatures where in VAR shows negative expansion? Yes, but we have not finished the diffraction measurements on that under pressure. We need to do that. It seems that the um, change in the phonon frequencies, uh, they still stiffen with pressure, uh, but it's a lot less than at room temperature. Also, the magnetism doesn't change as much either. So it might be they still cancel out, but then again, you have to be careful because all of the thermal expansion goes to zero at low temperatures anyway. I think it's going to be a delicate balance, whether it goes negative, I, I can't say yet. We may not be able to tell that from our, the quality of our experiments. Okay, Alfredo, do you want to ask a question? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Yes, I wrote the question just in case there. Um, my question is about the, um, how do you specifically analyze the ND trajectories, the IM and D trajectories, to generate this effective cubic potential? Okay, very good. Um, th there's a, a number of things I skipped over, obviously. Um, the first way that we did it, uh, it was an uh, algorithm developed by Uli Hellman, who developed this effective potential technique, uh, had uh, basically looked at all of the forces in the time steps and uh, the Hellman Feynman forces. Then he figured out for these displacements with the effective potential, what would be the forces? So he optimized the parameters in the effective potential to, to fit that for all of these time steps. That was pretty inefficient because it takes a while to change the crystal a lot uh, at 10 to the minus 15 seconds time steps. So what we've done more recently is we've been doing it, uh, instead of with a time average, we've been an ensemble averaging, where we put in phonons with their populations characteristic of that temperature. And we uh, then, uh, from those phonon displacements, uh, we see uh, whether uh, these, uh, we see what the Hellman Feynman forces are and uh, get an improvement effectively on the uh, uh, temperature dependent effective potential method, Cal recalculate the phonons and do it with a, an ensemble average. So that's a little unusual. It makes an assumption that the displacements are Gaussian, uh, which isn't completely right. Uh, but uh, it works for small and moderate anharmonicities. Uh, the full AIMD should work uh, for any anharmonicity, of course. I said a lot. I hope it made sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Jizu, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, hello, Russell. Hi. And yeah, so I have a question. So I study the equation of state of mineral in planet science. So. Uh, so from your method, uh, you generate effective potential and, and calculate the phonons. Uh, but we also have other uh, methods to calculate the quasi phonons at high temperature, like, like uh, we fit the phonons from the Fourier transform of velocity autocorrelation function, or from the TDEP software, we can fit a new uh, dynamical matrix and uh, diagonalize that. So does uh, do these methods agree uh, with your... Well, we haven't tried your method, but the principle is fine. What, what, what you've described sounds very good. Uh, it should agree. Uh, we have done a couple of cases in the past, not with these materials, uh, but we've looked at a couple of other oxides, and the agreement was reasonably good. We uh, tried some uh, what we call uh, frozen, frozen phonon calculations, where we had a big unit cell and put uh, short wavelength phonons in it. And uh, we went ahead and looked at velocity, velocity, autocorrelation functions, and they compared pretty well. So I think it'll be okay. Uh, so, so do these uh, two uh, ghost phonon modes dominate uh, at high temperature or only at low temperature for the entropy? Uh, I don't actually understand the, all the entropic effects here. We have to think of that. And I think we're going to have to go back to phase space and look at momentum and position trajectories to really tell what's going on here. Uh, but uh, these ghost modes uh, increase with temperature. Uh, they should exist at low temperature because there's a little bit of a zero point effect, but they'll be very weak, all right? Uh, they, they do show up even at room temperature though, which isn't all that hot uh, for sodium bromide. Oh, so, so it probably would uh, uh, change the equation of state totally, right? For, for the contribution of the 
ghost modes, right? Uh, what would be the contribution to the equation of state? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, my suspicion is it would not be big, but uh, at high temperatures, it might be important. But then there may be other effects at high temperatures in the equation of state uh, that would, would win over that even. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. I have one question, Russ. Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Uh, Brent, thank you for this talk, actually. Um, do you think your pressure dependent and temperature dependent studies at some point will enable to distinguish between electron gas compressibility versus compressibility due to interatomic forces? I, I'm not sure how to do the connection between the models that you described and the experiment other than to go ahead and calculate them and see what they do. Uh, for that, I, I, I don't have an answer at this point without having doing it. Done because it. of the correlated electron, in correlated electron systems, you know, under pressure, sometimes you go from metallic to semiconductor or insulator transitions. And obviously there, there should be a reflection of that in the phonon uh, spectrum, which can be measured. It, it's true, although I would think that maybe ARPES might be a, a, another way that would be more promising. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, you're right. There should be some effects on the phonons, and uh, the interactions between the atoms are uh, quite altered when you uh, uh, have a, you know, a metal uh, to insulator type of transition. It's true. Uh, how we would interpret that in terms of the phonons might be hard. We need some modeling. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is Shivram from Virginia. I have a question. Sure. Um, this is a kind of a sideways or exotic maybe question. Uh, since you talked about sodium bromide, I was reminded about sodium fluoride. There's uh, not well known, but uh, there's this phenomenon of second sound and uh, where you have uh, no umklap processes and this has been seen in sodium fluoride over a limited temperature range you're also doing measurements of uh, phonon dispersion and so on at low temperatures so i'm wondering if such a second sound would somehow show up at high wave vectors where you're measuring the measurements that exist now are very crude measurements uh, basically, they are, it's like propagating a sound wave at practically zero wave vector. Uh, so any comments on that? Hmm. Interesting. So mostly these are from acoustic measurements is what you're saying, ultrasonics right. or something. Right. Um, yeah, how would that work at shorter wavelengths? Um, I, I don't know. I think it might be... Uh, for what I would look for is I would look for the multiphonon processes that might be going away that you've described and uh, reducing the interactions between phonons. Uh, whether those would continue up to high uh, wave lengths, uh, high wave vectors, I right, right. Sort, of, sort of doubt because usually there's all sorts of differences in the types of kinematics that you can do to couple the phonons and they change a lot with the dispersions and the details. The long wavelength where everything is a straight line, it's a little easier. Uh, you can have one set of processes that holds up. But I need to find out more about that. If you want to send me a paper, I'd be interested to learn more. Yeah, these are 1970s papers by uh, Bobby Cole and company. Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah, I, I can't really say right now, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, it'll be interesting to follow up. Uh, maybe we can correspond over the Okay, email. okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Brent, I have Hi. a- Go ahead, Rani. Uh, yeah, talking about old data, I think you're old enough for that, uh, Brent. Uh, a long, long time ago, uh, while still at UCLA, I measured uh, the Grüneisen parameters of some alkali metals th directly. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it may uh, relate to your work and may be helpful in your calculations. These are fairly accurate measurements using adiabatic compression uh, in a 
isn't cylinder apparatus. I, I think I remember this dimly. Uh, there were some thermodynamic identities that you used to transfer your uh, uh, results that, of measurement into the Grunheisen parameter. Um, I can't remember quite how you did it. The way it's done, you adiabatically compress the sample in a hydrostatic medium, and then uh, you measure its temperature change. Oh, Both of I these see. Both measurements very accurately. And then all you need is the bulk modulus to get gamma. Right. This sounds hard to do, getting the temperature reliably under pressure like that, but... Uh... Yeah, I can send you the papers. These are seven. Okay, please do. Please do. I think it would be relevant here. I also have a comment. Uh, we have recently developed, and this may be helping your work in the future at Oak Ridge, we developed a new uh, cell that you may be very interested in. It's also a mini piston cylinder apparatus. It's sort of modeled after a, a technique that was developed by McWan. So yeah. now we're sitting at about five GPA. The sample volume is uh, several cubic millimeter, very large apertures. So, so this is, would probably be the ideal apparatus for you. If it you might to come back there. All right, we certainly should follow up. I think the big question is getting the background down on these pressure cells uh, with collimation or something like that out to the detectors. I don't know if you've worked on that. Yes, the background is extremely small because we're not using metals. You know? We're using okay. ceramics and we can easily collimate. So we've done some first single crystal measurements uh, looking at magnetic structure changes. Uh, Quite successfully. If you're interested, I'll, I'll fill you in on that. Yeah, uh, I, 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 you gave me a hint uh, in the past that you were doing this type of work. I don't know where you stand on it. Uh, this is the, uh, the whole key to all this work really are these pressure cells and whether you can control pressure and temperature in them. There's no question about that. So there's a whole field of science that it could open up, I think. So uh, I'd like to find more. Okay. I have a, a question, actually two parts, uh, connected to NVAR. So you mentioned first that uh, you had some ideas for measuring the magnetism in nickel, the nickel component. And then the second question is, um, the, the density of states you measure is a partial density of states. It's the density of states weighted by the iron Right. And so I'm wondering how big an approximation you're making by not uh, treating the full density of states. Yeah, the, excellent questions, actually. What about the nickel? Uh, the uh, uh, other iron nickel alloys that I've looked at, uh, which are not INVAR, uh, had uh, uh, neutron measurements and uh, NRIX measurements. So you get the iron 57 partial DOS, and then you get the total DOS for the neutrons. And the nickel didn't vary too much uh, from what the iron did. Now, whether that's true uh, for iron 36% nickel, I don't know. It would be a good thing for us to do, though. We could uh, do a, a powder or a plate neutron scattering to check that out. I don't think it's going to be the big effect. I think the um, magnetism of the nickel uh, needs uh, more examination. Uh, Van Schilfgaard and uh, Igor Abrikosov uh, had looked at this uh, some time ago, Andrew Vavinsky, uh, in a high profile paper, uh, which showed the individual moments of the nickel and the iron. Uh, we may try to extract something out of what we can see from their results. Uh, doing these disordered local moment models is uh, uh, really for specialists, I think, in electronic structure calculation. And I don't know if we would want to attempt anything other than just some sort of a random flipping of spins or comparing anti-ferromagnetism. Uh, so that may be a little troublesome to figure out uh, the entropy that way. Uh, if we could get, measure the magnetization of the whole alloy though, versus pressure, uh, that's an alternative. I don't know how to do that personally, but uh, maybe you do. Thanks. More questions? Well, if not, let's thank Brent. It was a great talk despite the difficulties. So thank
thanks for hanging in there. Wonderful. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thanks for tolerating me. <laughs> thanks, Brent. It's great. Bye bye.